Aloha, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the second session of the Strengthening ROK United States Science and Tech Partnership on Critical Technologies Dialogue titled A U.S.-South Korea Technological Alliance and Semiconductors, Promises, Pressures, and Prospects, held with support from the Consulate General of the Republic of Korea in Honolulu and in partnership with George Mason Korea Center for Security Policy Studies. My name is Mark Brian Manadan, a Senior Research Fellow and Director for Cybersecurity and Critical Technologies at the Pacific Forum, and I will be the moderator and host for today's session. Today's virtual discussion will conduct a cross-cutting analysis on the feasibility of a stronger U.S.-South Korea technological alliance and semiconductors in achieving robust and resilient semiconductor supply chain. Pacific Forum's new strengthening ROK United States Science and Tech Partnership and Critical Technologies Dialogue is a three-part online series plus an in-person workshop that examines the collaborative partnership between the United States and South Korea in artificial intelligence and robotics, semiconductors, cybersecurity, and 5G and 6G. This series aims to provide policy recommendations that will enhance the flow of investment, talent, and technology between the US and South Korea amid the fragmentation of regional supply chains, great power competition, and geoeconomic volatility. By the end, we hope participants will have a better grasp on how the US and South Korea can achieve policy alignment and synergy to spur greater uh, research and development collaboration in AI and robotics, semiconductors, cybersecurity, and 5G and 6G. For the first session, uh, titled U.S. and South Korea's Prospects and Challenges in AI and Robotics, we convened three experts who offered insights on how the U.S. and South Korea can navigate the complex and interlinked fields of artificial intelligence and robotics, reflecting on how the U.S. and South Korea can leverage their comparative advantages in AI applications. Our distinguished speakers shared their perspectives on how both countries could enhance existing public and private partnerships to promote deeper collaboration in the healthcare industry, robotics, and semiconductors. Artificial intelligence increasing application to discover new microchip technologies that can produce more advanced semiconductors was a notable takeaway from our first session. Likewise, semiconductors' central role in driving computational power and algorithmic tra training also highlighted its important role in the AI revolution. Key findings of the first session is now available through the link in our chat box. Building on the insights from our first session, today's virtual discussion, a U.S.-South Korea technological alliance and semiconductors, promises, pressures, and prospects, will examine the opportunities and challenges of U.S. and South Korea's collaboration and semiconductors. Former South Korean President Moon Jae-in vouched to create a semiconductor belt supported by the National Advanced Strategic Industry Act. Under the current UN administration, South Korea seeks to become a semiconductor superpower with calls to expand quotas for graduates in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Meanwhile, US President Joe Biden signed the CHIPS Act to provide 52 billion US dollars in subsidies for chip manufacturing and research, as well as an estimated 24 billion US dollars investment tax credit for chip plants. While policy mechanisms are unfolding to facilitate a US ROK technological alliance and critical technologies such as semiconductors, commitments are still far from solid. Now, um, allow me to introduce our three, uh, three speakers um, for today, and uh, it will be followed by a Q&A or uh, open discussion. This is a friendly reminder for all the speakers to keep their presentations to 10 minutes maximum so we can have ample time for questions and discussions. This session is one and a half hours total. Note that participants, uh, you may submit questions in the Q&A box as you have them during the presentations and you don't need to save them until the end. Today's presenters for a second session are Dr. Jun Park, political economist and Fung Global Fellow of the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies. Dr. Dan Kim, Vice President and Chief Economist of Sky Hynix. And Ms. Alexandra Seymour, Associate Fellow for the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American security. First, Dr. Jun Park is a 2021-2022 Fung Global Fellow of the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies at the Princeton University. In 2022, she was selected as an inaugural International Strategy Forum Asia Fellow by Schmidt Features. 
She's a political economist by training and works on trade, energy, and tech conflicts, analyzing different policy outcomes as a response to pressures based on governance structures. Her current work pertains to post-pandemic geoeconomic conflicts in data governance and emerging technology. Dr. Park, you may proceed with your presentation for 10 minutes. First of all, I'd like to thank the Pacific Forum, where I've been engaged as fellow overtime uh, non-resident and uh, as a non-resident fellow, James, James Kelly Fellow, and also a Korea Foundation inaugural fellow as a non-resident fellow. Uh, the, the questions that we have um, been uh, pondering upon on semiconductors, this has been a long um, journey. I would say for, for, from my side, it has been a painstaking journey from the days of the Japanese export curves on South Korean semiconductor industry. And that began in July of 2019. So we're already at, um, we're pushing three years and onwards. And I'm seeing that this will be a continuous kind of an endeavor um, going into the next decade because uh, in our time in the next decade, uh, AI will be deployed into several of our um, everyday life. And we're, we're looking into uh, UAM now, and we're, we're looking at a future that is more connected and we'll see the digital divide that's occurring um, currently as well. It's going to be exacerbated over time. So what I, I'd like to do as a former PacFarm fellow and uh, also um, oh, I forgot to thank the Mason Korea folks uh, as a former lecturer at Mason Korea. Uh, what I'd like to do is so, sort of go through the four points that I was asked to answer as part of the discussion. And I will give very brief, yet I'll try to be very concrete about uh, my answers. The first question is what will be the US and South Korea's comparative advantage in the CHIPS 4 Alliance or FAP 4 Alliance? Mind you, the Chip for, Chips 4 Alliance or FAP 4 Alliance, the details of this has not been clarified to the par partnering countries. There is an assumption that the US will seek to complement what it lacks, which is basically the foundry business. However, uh, when you're thinking about comparative advantage from more of an economic standpoint, what South Korea would like is a synergy effect by partnering with some of the US uh, designing companies. Um, it is not clear whether this chip for alliance or fat for alliance will embody that kind of nature. We will only be able to ascertain once the US uh, clearly shows what it intends through this alliance. And throughout my research, I have repeatedly said uh, throughout my presentations as well, uh, also at a brief hearing on Capitol Hill, that uh, technological alliance cannot exist because of the nature of this business. This, this um, sem semiconductor industry is highly competitive. It's a cutthroat industry. Uh, the competition will more uh, outplay uh, cooperative or cooperation mechanisms in the longer run. So we cannot say that there is an alliance set. Second, how can the US and South Korea improve trust and transparency on semiconductors given friction points on state subsidies and supply chain information? There's a lot to be said on this question because over time, what uh, we have witnessed in the relationships uh, of the U.S. trying to solicit foreign companies, foreign uh, foundry companies to come into the United States is that there is no consideration of alliance per se. It's only in the in consideration of make, make it an, in America, make chips in America. Uh, a good example of this is what was reported in the Wall Street Journal earlier this month when uh, Secretary Raimondo, uh, Commerce Secretary Raimondo was reported to have solicited uh, a Taiwanese company, um, uh, dissuade the Taiwanese company from investing in Korea and rather bring it to, uh, bring the investment to uh, the US. So what is clear is that the US is seeking to amalgamate all capacities of semiconductor fabrication and in, in, in addition to what it already possesses as a strength, into its own territory. 
And it's not just because of strategic competition as the polls showed, but it is also in preparation for a potential invasion of Taiwan by China. Thirdly, the third question was, how can the US and South Korean microchip uh, firms achieve a win-win strategy considering tight competition on cutting edge technologies and market share? So this question basically touches upon the realities of cooperation or uh, the limitations of any kind of government-led initiatives as opposed to what the industry actually faces in the real world. A win-win strategy would only exist if the policies are intended to be a two-way street. Currently, it is not. So in answering this question, the two-way street-oriented policy directions are not clear, and so this question cannot be answered. However, from the industry perspective, it may be the case that from the industry, uh, there may be uh, requests through um, uh, uh, government, the, the, the request for the 52 billion government subsidies, Samsung and SK will probably be lining up and receiving. Intel will take the lion's share. It's only 52 billion, so you can't really expect much from it, but still companies will buy to get uh, a chunk of that. Then um, the fourth question, how will South Korea accede to the Chips for Alliance? So again, uh, given South Korea, South, South Korean firms' commercial interests in China. Again, this question um, asks for something that cannot be in, answer, answered in full because Chips for Alliance is not exactly you know, clear what, what it actually intends to do. However, um, the commercial interest in China, so this is a very critical uh, component in terms of uh, how South Korea will try to reposition itself. If joining the Chips for Alliance uh, entails more than what South, Korea can, South Korean firms can um, actually commit to, I think that the Chips for Alliance would be very, very difficult, even if it is just set in stone as a government-led initiative, government-led initiative because South Korea operates two, um, two major companies, uh, Samsung and SK Hynix, they operate fabs in, um, in China, in Uxi and also Xi'an. So this is going to be a very difficult endeavor if and when the US demands closure or uh, a seizing in development of those fabs. So I will try to end it there and see if uh, Dr. Kim is available or uh, turn it over to Ms. Saiba. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Park, for giving us an overview of the current developments on the Chips for Alliance and also sharing with us your recent engagements with uh, industry representatives, um, especially as everyone is very much um, watching the developments very closely. Uh, moving forward, uh, our second speaker is Ms. Alexandra Seymour. Uh, she is an Associate Fellow for the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. Her work focuses on artificial intelligence standards and th uh, trustworthiness, defense technology innovation and modernization, international technology cooperation, and technology talent. Previously, Ms. Seymour worked at the AI security and validation startup Calypso AI. Prior to her time at Calypso AI, Samer served in the federal government, where she also served at the National Security Council staff in the Office of Strategic Communications. She's currently a visiting fellow at the National Security Institute at George Mason University. Ms. Samer, if you would. Well, thank you so much, Mark, and a big thank you to the Pacific Forum for hosting me. Um, I'm really excited for this conversation. Uh, I was saying earlier in our, our pre-session that I actually just got back from South Korea and was actually talking about, uh, of course, this is a very timely topic, and so this was integral to a lot of our conversations. Um, and semiconductors and supply chain issues have also been a big focus uh, for my team over at the Center for a New American Security. So I thought that in addition to answering some of the questions that uh, were asked that I know uh, Dr. Park just touched on, um, I wanted to just start by first uh, providing more context, a bit of an overview of where the US is, um, where uh, South Korea is, uh, and then kind of the areas that um, through my work I've identified for cooperation. 
So uh, as we laid out in the beginning, the U.S. Uh, just passed the Chips and Science Act, which was a massive bipartisan effort uh, for the U.S. This really was the first uh, big piece of industrial policy type legislation that we've seen since the 1980s. Um, so this is pretty significant, and it's it's significant that it was passed on a bipartisan basis, um, particularly because industrial policy is not a term uh, that we have typically embraced in the U.S. We've we've shied away from it to. Uh, really to focus on our free market principles. So we're really adopting a new approach to it as well, um, keeping those central to the way in which we conduct um, our activities. So within the, the, the Chips and Science Act, um, I, I think the first thing that's important to note uh, is the reason that this was bipartisan was that it really was a national security focused effort. Um, of course, there are going to be economic effects that are stemming from it, uh, but recognizing that uh, one of the statistics that has been put out a lot that from 1990 to 2020, um, the U.S.'s ability uh, for semiconductor manufacturing decreased from 37% to 12%. So we've really been focused on trying to bring back some of that domestic capability um, for, as the poll had alluded to, in light of the U.S. strategic competition, um, as well as for the supply chain issues that we're trying to address, wanting to bring some of those capabilities home um, in the event that something happens so that we're not replying, uh, we're not depending on sole source uh, or having to worry about proximity issues. Um, so just briefly within this legislation, there of course were the 52 billion for semiconductor manufacturing subsidies. Um, these included guardrails for the companies that would receive uh, the funding. So that would be um, that companies receiving it would not be able to invest in China or other adversarial nations uh, for 10 years. Um, there were also big commitments to R&D uh, spending and invest. Uh, there were the tax credit provisions. And then the science part, which is yet to be appropriated. Um, a lot of this has to go towards workforce development, other R&D funding, um, and standing up regional tech hubs as well uh, to try and um, share information at, at a more local level and build up that capacity. Um, so the next thing, at least for the U.S., is going to be figuring out exactly how we are going to implement uh, this really big bill. Um, and the way in which we do it is going to be key um, and, and really is going to determine where we go in terms of these types of investments going forward. Um, so part of this is going to be the way that the U.S. works with industry, as well as how it's working with its allies and partners. Um, South Korea, uh, well, of course, uh, before I go to that, um, so the U.S., of course, has been working from our end through a lot of different formats, through the Quad, the TTC, AUKUS, there's lots of agreements. Um, and I'll go into the CHIP4 as I discuss South Korea. Um, so South Korea is really a, a key partner for the U.S. I think the one thing to understand is we're thinking about cooperation between the two countries, um, whereas the U.S. had viewed its investment into semiconductors uh, really from a national security lens, um, South Korea uh, approaches uh, everything through an economic security lens. Uh, I think we touched on the fact that China is integral to South Korea's economy, too. It's, uh, you know, the largest trading partner uh, and, and in the past has viewed it as, you know, the economy is with China and security is with the U.S. I think that now under President Yoon, we are seeing shifts in that as well, um, where he's taken a bit more of an assertive stance uh, on China. Um, than his predecessors have, uh, and is, is seeing the economy as more of a global effort. Um, I think both him and, and his pre predecessor, President Moon, had both emphasized the need to, to focus on values and, and standards and, and cooperation globally. Um, so I, I know that uh, President Biden had met both with President Moon and President Yoon, um, and, and they had agreed to a lot of different areas in terms of R&D exchanges, uh, and, and trying to boost up semiconductor manufacturing um, and figuring out exactly how that cooperation is going to work uh, and wanting to do that. Um, so I think the other important thing to note is that um, because uh, South Korea is focused more on the economic security side of things, they also are coming from a place of protection, whereas I think the U.S. is, is coming from both the protection side and also the, the more promotion on the global scale. Um, to get into CHIP4 specifically, now I, I think uh, from, from what I have gathered, um, 
I, I completely agree with what has already been laid out. Um, number one, yes, chip four is still, um, it was a U.S. idea, and there are still a lot of questions that are up in the air. I think the proposed agenda off the bat was going to be to look at uh, R&D, workforce, uh, supply chain, resiliency, uh, and subsidies. But of course, none of these details have been hashed out. And so it's going to be interesting to see. Um, I know President Yoon has said in a recent New York Times uh, interview that cooperation among the four countries is necessary in some degree, but of course what that looked like is still, what that will look like is up in the air. Um, I think that some areas for opportunity, whether it is through this structure, of course, recognizing um, that there are going to be challenges both with uh, among the companies that are involved with um, within those uh, four countries, um, because there's, uh, as Dr. Park had said, there's innately going to be competition, uh, and that's going to come to the forefront. So that's going to make it uh, very difficult, and we're going to have to figure out how to be complementary uh, in the way that we work together, um, particularly with companies that are operating in the same space. Um, so that's going to be one thing. Um, and I'm also just making sure when we're working with a, a broader alliance. But uh, I think that uh, whether bilaterally or within the structure or within a broader structure that in includes more countries that are committed to, to bolstering the global supply chain, um, a couple things that come uh, to mind, um, both countries are very invested in research security. I think that this is a great area, uh, both that and IP protection. Um, to ensure that the, both countries are really protecting their innovation uh, and working through making sure that those protections are in place and are coordinating so that when, when they're trying to work together, um, whether from the government level or ensuring that industry has those protections and that they're going into those conversations more confidently and able to work through those. Uh, I think that uh, another area as well, um, really would be on workforce. South Korea has done an incredible job with building up its workforce, um, both in uh, high-end positions all the way through to just operating uh, any of their fabs. Uh, and I think that that's something that the U.S. struggles with, as, uh, is going to struggle with as it tries to bring that capacity uh, to the United States, is that it just does not have the, the robust network. Uh, of course, tech talent is something that is lacking across the board and something that uh, I think all countries are experiencing. Um, but that is going to be a, a key aspect to being able to um, actually stand up, at, at least in the United States, to stand up fabs. Um, and I think given that... Um, South Korea and the US both have individual strengths as well, will be a great opportunity to partner and to share information and to share skills. Um, for the US, the US is uh, leading in design capabilities. Of course, South Korea is leading in uh, memory capabilities. So I think that there are um, ways that uh, we can be complementary, particularly as the U.S. has decided to, uh, both the U.S. and Korea have decided to invest and, and prioritize the, the semiconductor industry. Uh, coordinating now is uh, going to be very, very important for making sure that we have comp uh, complementary um, supplied, uh, complementary capabilities, and that's only going to ensure um, broader uh, supply chain resiliency. Um, so, I think in terms of that, uh, I'll probably stop there at least to start um, there and just wrap up with saying that, yes, there are going to be challenges within within CHIP4, um, but whether that or whether it's working with, uh, you know, U.S. South Korea directly, there are opportunities to, to shore up research security, um, to work on IP protections and to share knowledge through uh, workforce skill exchange. So thank you very much. And I will pass it back over to you, Mark. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Samer, for highlighting the convergence and divergent points, um, particularly between the United States and, and South Korea in terms of implementing the CHIPS for Act or the CHIPS for, and also um, emphasizing uh, the comparative advantages of both countries and how we can um, sort of facilitate um, the feasibility of, of achieving um, the goals that are laid out um, with this very ambitious um, policy from the U.S. government. And I would like to encourage our audience to please start submitting your questions. Um, you don't need to wait until the Q&A session for you to start um, submitting your questions. You can use our Q&A uh, at the 
uh, command um, at the bottom of the Zoom chat to send your questions. Um, and also we have a terrific um, audience uh, from the list of the people in the audience. I could say of um, experts who are also working in this area. So please uh, feel free to send in your questions. And now uh, to our final speaker, we have Dr. Dan Kim. He is the Vice President and Chief uh, Economist of SK Hynix and heads the Economic and Growth Strategy Team based in Washington, D.C. Dr. Kim directs strategic analysis related to the company's global growth, supply chains, and economic policy, particularly related to the company's presence and growth in the United States. Previously, Dr. Kim was the Director of Economic Strategy at Qualcomm, where he led analysis related to the company's various legal, economic, and policy matters. In the U.S. government, Dr. Kim was the Senior International Economist for the United States International Trade Commission, where he directed investigations on microelectronics, critical supply chains, and digital trade matters. Dr. Kim, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm going to share a screen here um, and share some numbers because uh, I'm the economist. So uh, I'm going to uh, take the privilege to do that. All right. So um, I do have some comments about the previous speakers, and I really want to thank them for laying out the uh, laying out the scene here. And I'm hopeful that I could add a little bit more to um, to what they're saying, about what they have already said. Um, one thing I would note is that. In my view, the U.S.-Korea semiconductor ecosystem is already one of the most uh, successful and highly co cooperative ecosystem there is in any technology bilateral relationship. Um, I am all for strengthening this, but I don't think we should start with the assumption that it's not working well or that there's lots of deficiencies within it. Um, I think it's highly successful already um, that we just need to bolster and strengthen. So that's, that's uh, my first point. Um, most people haven't heard of SK Hynix, uh, perhaps in this audience they have, uh, but if you look at this chart here, uh, if you look at the top five revenue leaders for the semiconductor industry, they are either Korean or American firms. Um, so this is uh, last uh, two years ago, uh, last year, um, where we were the number three supplier of semiconductors in the world. Um, this does not include foundries. If you included foundries, TSMC would definitely be within the top five. And of course, you have um, um, Intel, Micron, and Qualcomm as uh, the rounding out the top top five, uh, with Samsung being number one in terms of revenue. Um, now, I think sometimes we discuss semiconductors as if it's a, a end use of it in itself. We have to forget that they are foundational technologies that are essentially intermediate goods for downstream production and services. Um, if you look at which sectors consume uh, semiconductors the most. They tend to be computing, um, communications, um, and those two I've highlighted in color because they those are the ones that tend to use the most leading edge capacity. Um, and then you also have automotive consumer goods and industrial, as well as very, very small percentage of direct use by the government. This is a global number here, and I've highlighted those in gray figures because those tends to be, majority of it, of it is being used uh, uh, for what we call either trailing edge or lagging edge technologies. Um, and that's where we saw most of the shortages uh, during the pandemic and beyond. Um, whereas we did not really see much of shortage uh, in, the, uh, in the leading edge space, including in memory products that we supply. Um, but it's everywhere, um, up to you know, uh, 3,500 semiconductors are required to build a new car now. And your phone doesn't just have one chip, it actually has about 170 chips. Um, and uh, more than 10 of them uh, are also in your coffee machine. So it is pervasive in our lives. Um, so there are significant economic activity at each stage of the supply chain, but it is ultimately an inter intermediate product. Um, I've highlighted here uh, some of the economic analysis that we've done here internally, because we wanted to see what global impact we've had economically as a company, because we spend so much of our investments purchasing um, equipment, materials, and other uh, things that need to enable our facility, global facilities, what we call upstream spending. And then, of course, we have significant operations globally. But we also wanted to track how much economic activity we enable downstream. And when we tracked all of that, uh, we found that we support about uh, $40 billion worth of economic activity upstream. 
and then um, about 315,000 jobs. But downstream is more significant. These are your mobile phones. These are your laptops. These are your servers. About $167 billion of economic activity we support and more than a million jobs. Um, so we do sit in a critical space. Um, now, to put figures on uh, the comparative advantages that uh, our previous speakers have, have alluded to, um, the US is by far the, the leading country when it comes to semiconductors. Um, they capture about 54% of the global uh, semiconductor revenue um, and they consume about 33% of it. And so they're, consumer, they're leaders in both production and consumption of chips. You see in Korea there, we have about 22% of the revenue and about 11% of consumption. Um, you know, uh, Ms. Seymour uh, referred to this uh, uh, statistic here, the concern in, in the orange figure that you see um, uh, on the left, um, uh, about 40% of a global production capacity within the US that has shrunken down to 12%. But if you actually look at the share of revenue that US industry has captured, it started out around the same, around 40%, but it actually has increased. So what you're seeing here is that the US industry has figured out ways to increase its competitiveness overall um, while uh, managing to outsource uh, various parts of the production overseas. Um, there is various factors for that. There, ha there has been the memory consolidation as well as the um, proliferation of the, uh, the foundry model um, that TSMC has, has become a leader in. Um, but you know, uh, make no mistake, the US industry has been a huge beneficiary of the shifts that we've seen in the last 30 years. Um, I understand the desire to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to bring more domestic production back um, but still by far the US is the leader in this space. Um, another, uh, another way to look at it is that the US is uh, dominating in terms of design automation software as well as core IP. Um, and in the semiconductor ecosystem globally would not exist or function without the manufacturing equipment that is sourced from the US. Um, and of course the logic chips um, that is designed um, and sold are uh, three thirds of which is uh, captured by US companies. Um, and yes, we do uh, produce quite a bit of memory chips within the, within, uh, in, by Korean firms, including uh, by SK Hynix, but US firms also have some, some significant presence there as well. Um, so uh, I am of the opinion that the industry will in the future be driven by technology partnerships and consortiums. Um, partly because the scaling that we have achieved as an industry in terms of shrinking the transistors and getting the raw power uh, of Moore's law, um, meaning doubling the, uh, doubling the number of transistors within the same square inch of the uh, silicon, that, that, is, that road is running out of room in terms of both economic and uh, physics of, of Moore's law. Um, so what is now needed is better communication um, and better incorporation of different types of chips, such as memory, such as logic um, and analog, so that the chips themselves communicate better and integrate it better. And that inherently means more cooperation. Um, so I actually do see good bright prospects for technology cooperation between the United States and Korea, not only at the government level, but also at the, at the company level. Um, and this includes uh, chips that make logic and memories, but also includes companies that are up and down the, uh, 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 the supply chain. And by that, I mean the upstream suppliers, the equipment makers, materials, as well as our customers. Uh, we will all need to uh, be in sync in terms of how to cooperate better um, to push for the technology that has been such a critical part of our daily lives. Um, I just uh, wanted to leave it there um, in terms of presenting the numbers. Just wanted to make a couple of comments uh, in the minute that I have. Um, one, I, I definitely agree that the CHIPS4 has not articulated itself, at least by the US government, as to the primary purpose of that and the agenda. And I think I do find it interesting that 
Korea and the United States already has a very fruitful bilateral dialogue when it comes to su supply chain security that has substantial portions of semiconductors within it. Um, and that seems to be driven by the Department of Commerce in the United States um, and its counterpart in Korea. Whereas the CHIPS 4 seems to be driven more uh, by the State Department in the United States and its counterpart in Korea. So I think we have to be careful not to draw conclusions about which actors within both of these governments are driving it. Um, and I would also say that um, I'm certainly, I certainly hope that uh, the, the CHIPS Act grants, um, $39 billion, which will go for manufacturing grants, uh, that the lion's share will not go to any one particular company, that it would be distributed um, according to the, uh, the strengths of the applications that we put in. Um, so I'll leave it there um, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim, uh, for your remarks and, and giving us uh, more details about, you know, reinforcing the idea of the stronger U.S. Uh, South Korea um, bilateral cooperation in semiconductors. And also thank you to our other panelists, Dr. Park and Ms. Samer for sharing your thoughts on this very uh, timely topic on semiconductors. I'm very sure that there are many questions and comments uh, from the audience. We have about 30 minutes left for questions um, and discussions. Um, and also to our participants, let me remind you that you have two options for asking questions or making comments. One is to raise your hand in the webinar controls, uh, which is accessible from the participants tab. And the other is to open the Q&A window. To ask a question, you can type your question into the Q&A box and click send. If you raise your hand to ask your question verbally, the host will enable your microphone and will ask you to unmute yourself. And please be ready to unmute yourself. So I think we have a couple of questions uh, some of our colleagues have posted in the Q&A box. Let me begin with um, a question from um, Su Young Park. Uh, the question is, how did the COVID-19 impact uh, the shortage of chips affect South Korea's place as one of the global semiconductor makers? Did COVID-19 implications um, give South Korea more diplomatic or economic power? I think the question is um, open to all our um, speakers, if you'd like to share your thoughts, um, Dr. Park, Ms. Samer, or and Dr. Kim? Um, well, you know, one thing I would note is that there were short shortages of various different types of chips, um, but not in the memory semiconductors that South Korean companies uh, are very, very good at making. Um, in fact, you know, we, we filled out the survey that the U.S. You know, Commerce Department had asked us to fill out. Um, and we were very forthcoming. Um, and I think the fact that uh, we were very resilient in our supply, um, particularly our supply to US uh, information technology firms that we sell to, um, had a positive implication on the diplomatic economic power that we have, um, that we were reliable and we continue to do so. Um, so from a company's perspective, I think um, I think we've shown ourselves to be um, good good actors uh, in, in the bilateral relationship. Yeah, I think the effects of COVID, I, as we all know, really highlighted that um, the urgency to address global supply chains and shown just how we, how intertwined that we were um, and how there are areas that can be very vulnerable. So I think it, it, it was a wake up call and the semiconductor industry was one of the most urgent ones. I think for all of the reasons that were uh, listed in the poll that you put out in the beginning um, between, you know, U.S. China strategic competition, China's potential invasion of Taiwan, um, and fragmentation of the global supply chain. I think all of those reasons, um, at least from the U.S. perspective, uh, number one, from and from that national security perspective, kind of drove us to start making investments, um, but also kind of highlighted the urgency of uh, the need for partners to work together and to figure out what it means to build a trusted supply chain. Um, so I think recognizing the role that South Korea has had uh, in the semiconductor industry and, and because of the strong partnership that we already have had, only uh, bolstered it through, through the crisis and has uh, laid the groundwork for our continued cooperation. Dr. Park, any thoughts? 
I think this question has been thoroughly answered. Oh, thank you so much. I think one of the recurring themes across all the three speakers this afternoon is the lack of articulation of what's the chips for. And if I'm gonna give you the magic wand to articulate what you would want uh, the chips for to be, what would that be like? It's a hypothetical question, but I'm asking all the panelists if, if um, because the, I think the recurring sort of concern was the lack of articulating what the chips for is all about and remains in terms of details and in terms of how it's going to be implemented still remains scant. And you know, if you would be, um, if you have the magic wand to sort of um, have the capacity to craft the chips for, how would you want it uh, crafted or, or um, formulated for it to be a successful technological partnership between the US and South Korea? I can jump in and take that one first. Um, so yes, I think that at least it, it is difficult to say um, exactly what it would look like. I, I pose this question to a lot of people myself, um, but I do think that one area, at least for cooperation, that would make sense um, between the US and South Korea and across these countries is on the workforce front and just sharing the knowledge of, of skills. Um, I think because you know, all of these countries are, are looking both to make their own domestic uh, investments, um, but also do want to contribute to a more resilience, uh, build resilience at home, but also to contribute to a more resilient and, and trusted supply chain abroad. Um, and, I, and people are the key to that. So I think being able to exchange knowledge on skills um, would, would be a good first step in terms of uh, how to coordinate best practices and, and skills so we can all be better off. Can I give a realistic count account of this? Basically, I think it's going to be about export controls and uh, trying to solicit engineers into the United States because what the US is essentially in need of are additional manufacturing capabilities and engineers. Mm -hmm. And without the export controls, it's not going to be addressing the supply chain risks. However, from the Taiwanese and South Korean standpoints, from both the government and industry perspectives, it may not align well with the U.S. interests. Dr. Kim. Um, yeah, I mean, to echo Dr. Park's points, I, I'm pretty sure that Japan has already uh, articulated that they do not want export controls to be part of the discussions of just four. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I will note is that uh, if, you know, let's, let's think about the other participants of chips four, uh, we have Europe as well as, um, Japan and Korea actually is in a sense a little bit uh, of a different uh, has a different place in the ecosystem. U.S., uh, Japan, uh, European uh, companies all have very strong presence in the equipment space, uh, whereas Korea does not. Mm -hmm. um, Japan and Europe has been. Uh, declining in its manufacturing of semiconductors along with the US. So whereas in Korea has been increasing. Mm -hmm. So there's really not a lot of commonalities that ties the four together. Um, and it's not just a matter of Korea and the US agreeing on something. It's a matter of Korea and Japan agreeing on something. It's a matter of Japan and Europeans agreeing on something. Um, I'm sure as international, econ uh, international economists or political scientists here, Coalitions are very, very difficult to formulate, especially with diverse interests at any international forum. Um, um, you know, look how well the WTO is doing, look how well these other, you know, forums are doing uh, when you have diverse interests. And quite frankly, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not wishing this on chips for all coalitions come to an end, right? Um, and that's because there is, there is, uh, there is a varied interest. So um, that's just a, that's just a commentary that I think, um, until there is stated objectives and until there are responses to those stated objectives, um, I think it will exist as something that's there. Um, but I will note that the US already has bilateral discussions with respect to all of these issues with each of those partners. Um, so whatever objectives they uh, you know needs to be accomplished, I'm sure they have an avenue to do so. 
it's interesting that you guys pointed uh, that you pointed out the, the uh, Japan as well in the conversation, injected Japan in the conversation, because one of the questions here was, what is the impact of the business relationship between ROK and Japan following disputes between the two major nations in pushing ROK to the U.S. in semiconductor manufacturing cooperation and cooperation in tech industry more broadly? Is the poor ROK Japan business relationship causing more of that cooperation with the United States, or is the impetus more so competition with China and balancing reliance on the Chinese market? I think Dr. Park has done research on on uh, the relationship between ROK and Japan ever since, and also the, this question is open to other um, panelists as well. So, if the question is alluding to the expert curse by the Japanese government. I I have indicated in my research that it it doesn't seem to be a, an issue that could be overcome in a matter of uh, you know months or even years because essentially what the Japanese side is asking for is basically uh, overhaul an overhaul of the Supreme Court decision on forced labor that is basically at the uh, at the uh, core of the divide and although the japanese ministries especially um the um, foreign, foreign affairs ministry denies the relevance to the case it's exactly uh, at the core sitting at the core of this divide and uh i am not really i'm not um i'm not confident to say whether this is pushing this this relationship the deterioration is actually pushing the rok to to the us related um efforts that are occurring currently because uh the rok japan relationship is essentially you know the supreme court case as i said it's actually at the at the very core and what the us uh has been driving since the the onset of um the the chip shortages, especially during the 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 second second uh, year of the pandemic, I think there is more relevance to Taiwan than this ROK Japan because Taiwan has been highlighted as the the power player in terms of manufacturing, mainly TSMC. But I'll leave it to other comments as well. Um. Uh, Ms. Seymour, I'll, I'll jump in if you don't mind. Um, so I'm not going to comment on the social issues that Dr. Park is commenting. I think it's dangerous ground for someone like me to do so. But I will say um, that if you look at the history of pol economic policy related to semiconductors or really electronic products generally from the 1990s, it was to actually get rid of as much trade frictions as possible, right? Mm -hmm. To make sure that it truly was a globalized system where uh, where companies and countries can specialize in their strengths, um, that it truly would create globalized supply chains where compared advantages can be, could be taken advantage of. And all of that has been a really fantastic result um, for the economy as well as for the consumers, right? Um, the fact that we are all have a phone in our pockets that have billions of transistors with more computing power that could have been imagined you know, 30 years ago, I think is a testament to that. Um, so when you start uh, to introduce restrictions to access to commercially available products um, where there are dependence of these things because of economies of scale, um, I think what you do risk is um, having your own strengths become um, diluted because you introduce motivations to diversify yourselves away from those control technologies. Um, and I think you start to see that um, by uh, seeing um, choices of uh, those controlled uh, materials that you know that is at the heart of these disputes um, to see if you know there'll be alternative sources for those things and these are the exact kind of things that the that you know your companies and your countries uh, do not want right because what you want to be is reliable um, and you want to have predictability for your customers and if you take that away out of the control of the companies um, then I think you get some um, economically irrational results as a, as, as a result. Um, and, you know, and when, when this was all happening, I think we would also, uh, you know, we would always at, get asked the question, couldn't you double up on your supply on these things? And, you know, and I think 
you know, the, the quick answer that I give to that is, you know, for us to enable our factories around the world, we have about 3,000 suppliers um, mm -hmm. at, at varying degrees of specialty. Mm -hmm. And so to double up on those suppliers, um, just because in case they become, you know, part of a unrelated, you know, political dispute is impractical. Um, so we kind of have to take this case by case and, and deal with it. Um, uh, but I will say that, um, you know, we try our best to stay out of the politics, but we do have to have secure supply chains to make sure that we do um, um, uh, ensure a su steady supply of our chips because we know how important it is to our customers. Thank you so much for those responses. I would um, combine two questions related to China. Um, and this is where uh, I think the, fir the first question is, where does China fit into technology cooperation as a supplier of parts and components? And obviously, sharing high technology is not viable. And also the question on China's potential response um, from the government level, as well as business level, to the so-called Chips for initiative, particularly uh, to companies such as SK Hynix. Um, would any of our speakers be keen to um, respond? Uh, so, China um, is an important uh, part of the technology supply chain. Um, first, they are a large consumer. They're not. Uh, there, you know, over half of the imports of semiconductors go to China, but that doesn't mean that they consume all of it domestically. It just goes into assembly of electronic goods. So the the trade figures do tend to be um, inflated and tells the tells the wrong picture. Uh, but they do consume quite a bit of chips, and they are an important market for I would say all semiconductor companies that exist that you know, trade internationally. Um, so that goes to American companies, Korean companies, Japanese companies. Um, I think. You know, if you can find me one company that has global presence and tells you that they don't have any interest um, in uh, having access to the Chinese market, I think they, <laughs> I would like to talk to that person because I'm not sure if I've ever met that person. Um, I'll also say that uh, if you look very, very upstream, um, they play a critical role in the uh, mineral, supply of minerals um, um, and they, they do have uh, quite a bit of influence over the rare earths as well. Um, and uh, they do have some foundry presence um, and they are trying to break into the memory ecosystem as well. Um, so there are some supply relationships that do occur um, between uh, Chinese semiconductor makers as well as uh, and, and, um, and end use customers um, uh, globally. So, but, you know, no secret that they've been trying to catch up to the rest of the world um, and trying to become a little bit more self-reliant. Actually, I'm not sure if they have continued to use the term self-reliant as much as become more globally competitive, um, particularly if you look at how uh, how successful the entry of um, both Huawei and its uh, sem uh, semiconductor design arm, High Silicon, has been. Um, I think they were definitely and and their participation in the 5G standards. I think definitely they've been uh, they've changed the strategy from becoming self-contained to definitely more globally competitive, um, and I think that has uh, implications for, for uh, global technology cooperations as well. Yeah, so I think what I would say, at least from the U.S. perspective, uh, looking at this, of course, it's framed in the U.S. At, and anything with the technology competition, U.S.-China competition is kind of core and is a lot of the impetus for, for the U.S. Uh, taking a faster approach uh, in, in its own technology development and use and cooperation and trying to get ahead. Um, I think for the U.S., as you saw, uh, I, one of the biggest concerns is just um, China's approach to, uh, to technology, which is often dual use. Um, their, uh, their tactic of uh, civ uh, military civil fusion is something that is very concerning to the U.S. Um, only because uh, for any high-end capabilities, there is the possibility that it could be used for military purposes. Um, so I think that is something that concerns the U.S. and, and has driven efforts such as uh, the export controls that were um, put on NVIDIA and AMD uh, to export to China and to Russia. And I think that's something we can continue to see as the U.S. defines exactly where those thresholds are and what capabilities um, that they think um, 
we, we should be trying to move out of China for the sake of national security, uh, we'll be seeing more uh, actions uh, likely like that, I think, uh, to follow. Uh, so I, I think at least that for the U.S., it, it views it through the national security lens and, and for those high tech capabilities uh, moving out of China uh, because of the potential for for uh, dual use nature is something that is is very important. Dr. Park, if you want to add. I agree uh, with what um, Dr. Kim has pointed out on the, the consumer um, reliance as uh, China, the China's, Chinese market continues to be the, one of the primary destinations for export. Um, and the reason why I said that, you know, despite the Japanese intent to not include export controls in the chip four, uh, the main U.S. intent appears to be the case that in the event of uh, an invasion or in the event that in the Ukraine crisis, nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons are used, or um, in the event that China tries to engage in AI-driven missile launches or interception using certain semiconductors, uh, the U.S. doesn't want such a future to uh, come. And that's why I was uh, alluding to the fact that export controls will still be on the agenda, whether Japan likes it or not. Um, the thing is, uh, when it comes to China, uh, the tech cooperate into technological cooperation that the U.S. is considering, I don't think China is in there, but China is mainly there as uh, the prime export destination, as um, Dr. Kim mentioned. So there is an anomaly here. Uh, because all, all of these companies are relying on the Chinese uh, market revenue. At the same time, they're in competition, but they want to curb from the government perspective. So there is a mismatch there. So I think that's very telling based on some of the insights that our um, speakers have shared. Uh, moving along to some of the final few questions. Uh, that we have, how would CHIPS Act, uh, which also intends to create jobs in America, make an impact on revenue for U.S. companies? Uh, Mr. Jake Sullivan told the U.S. is considering outbound investment screening. What is SK Hynix or business thoughts on this? Also, I think a uh, related, um, related question to that is fabrication in the U.S. viable without extensive subsidies? that are subject to political wins and foreign trade complaints. So I think we're now at the sort of perspective of, of the US. If any of our panelists would like to provide a response, those two interrelated questions. Um, so you're asking for SK Hynek's perspectives on uh, Jake Sullivan's comments. Um, I have nothing but the highest of regards and and uh, and and respect to Mr. Jake Sullivan and any comments he chooses to make. Um, so I'll leave it at that from the company's perspective. <laughs> um, uh, I, honestly, I, I do I do feel that he and his team uh, that they've assembled uh, at the NSC are, are actually quite quite engaged and um, very thoughtful to approach these things. And um, um, and uh, I you know they've been engaged with us as well. And so you know we, we're grateful for that. Um, you know, outbound investment is something that they've been uh, thinking about for a long time in terms of the U.S. government. Um, it was sort of rumored to be part of the CHIPS Act itself. They couldn't quite get consensus on it at the Senate level. And so now I think it's more on the executive order side of it. Um, I'm sure Ms. Seymour could get more into that because I'm sure she's tracking that closely. Um, you know, we will see uh, what kind of shape it takes. Um, we understand uh, the... Uh, the impetus behind it, um, and you know, we're hopeful that we could uh, uh, um, provide our own thoughts as to you know what practically can be done about the concerns they have. Ms. Mm -hmm. Seymour. Yeah, I guess just to add on to that. So yes, I think outbound investment screening has been something that has continued to come up in conversations. And you can see that the administration is becoming more serious about it. And it has come through a lot of executive orders. Um, and it, it does continue to be discussed at, at those levels. So I think that's something that we can anticipate. And I think it's something that the U.S. wants to coordinate with allies and partners. Um, so it is going to come up in, in any of these multilateral fora, uh, whether 
it's South Korea or other partners, as we're just looking to build a, a an alternative and a, and a big trusted supply chain um, with with like minded allies and partners. Um, I think on the viability question in terms of if we would be able to do this uh, without subsidies, I think that just chips and science was a recognition that um, it, there did come a point, uh, particularly because a lot of uh, other countries have uh, have had big subsidies that have enabled their uh, their sectors to thrive. Uh, and for the pace and, and the scale that we needed, particularly because we didn't have adva advanced, uh, many advanced uh, manufacturing capabilities in the US, recognizing that that extra injection of resources uh, was going to be able to uh, hopefully catapult it and move it forward to build it up. Now, of course, that's only the beginning. Um, I think the way that the U.S. implements this as a first step uh, is going to be very telling in, in terms of its ability to succeed and will also be, uh, will show how, how much um, more resources are needed, at least at home. But I think it will also be critical uh, to see how the U.S. Uh, begins to put in place uh, the policies to cooperate effectively with allies and partners, recognizing that you can't build an entire supply chain uh, within one country. It is going to take a, a networked approach and, and working with allies and partners. Uh, so I think there's a lot more that we're going to, to see, um, but this is a first step. And I think it was a recognition that we did need resources uh, in order to build the capacity that we wanted to see. Um. Dr. Park, is it okay if I take another shot um, at, at this one? Okay, so um, this is something that I feel, find myself repeating uh, often when it comes to uh, the debate about subsidies. Um, I see very little evidence, if, if at all, that the competitiveness of the Taiwanese and the Korean industries are maintained because of government subsidies. I just don't see evidence of it, right? Um, I know it's been a lobbying line here in the United States, um, to get CHIPS Act fu funded passed, funding passed, uh, that somehow, you know, most of the cost differentials that exist between the U.S. and East Asia, particularly with Taiwan and Korea, is because of uh, government subsidies by Taiwanese and Korean governments. I see no evidence of this. Um, you know, in fact, I, you know, I, um, I think if you look at the history of trade remedy cases, particularly in the, in the, uh, in the memory space, um, you see how um, hesitant the government's would be to provide any kinds of financial ass assistance uh, in, uh, in commodity traded uh, semiconductors. So um, let's, before we start blaming uh, Asian, uh, East Asian countries, uh, perhaps with the exception of China, for, uh, for, for subsidies and stealing jobs away from, from the US, let's give credit where it's due. Um, this is an industry that requires long-term investments in infrastructure, in workforce, um, in universities, uh, and long-term patient capital by companies to take incredible risks in the short and long-term. Every time we decide to build a fab, it's a risk to our company. If it doesn't pan out, that's a huge risk to us. Um, TSMC, to its credit, um, saw the opportunity to get into the foundry space, trained its workforce, got the government to focus on the workforce training, and actually did it the right way. Right, so I think we are in a in a dangerous spot where um, we could be tempted um, to demonize um, subsidies, uh, you know, um, uh, so-called subsidies in um, in Taiwan and Korea, where I see no evidence that that they first of all happened or that they are what really drove the competitiveness of those places. They're incredibly efficient workers there. They're incredibly efficient and talented engineers there. Um, the trade secrets um, that drive the processes at, at the three nanometer, two nanometer nodes. Um, this is a talented workforce that Taiwan and Korea has developed over time. And that's why the manufacturing has gone there. Um, it's not because of, you know, because the labor, labor happens to be, you know, certain percent cheaper. Um, and so I understand that, you know, it's an easy political answer uh, perhaps within the United States to say, oh, only if we had a little bit of boost here, financial assistance wise, everything will be equalized. That's simply not the case, right? Um, and so I think we have to start at the place where there was specialization. The US industry is doing fantastic. If you want the, some of the production back, you have to invest in the infrastructure and the workforce that tends to bring, you know, that tends to attract that kind of production 
in these locations. Um, so I know that was a bit of a rant, but um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, is fabrication in the US viable without extensive subsidies? I would almost turn that around. Um, if you have the right, if you have the right um, infrastructure, right, re, you know, workforce and the right talent and the right capital system, um, any place can be can be a viable place to produce semiconductors if you if you want to do it, right? Um, there will always be a pull towards you know building in your home country for for a variety of reasons, um, but I think I admire what the U.S. company what the what the U.S. government is trying to do. They see a need for both economic and national security reasons. I don't argue with that. Um, I just don't think there needs to be a demonization or wrong arguments about what what is you know what has made Taiwan and Korea successful in the first place. And I think that's particularly important if you want to try to learn lessons that has gone well in South Korea as well as in Taiwan and try to replicate some of those things that have gone there rather than trying to create a zero sum game. I think there's the gains to be had everywhere, right? Um, so anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Dr. Park, any no, thoughts? Anywhere where there's electricity and water because without it, you can't do the, the operations. Um, I would just add to the question that was raised on extensive subsidies, et cetera, that, okay, so if we're looking at the SCM agreement at the WTO, how are we gonna enforce that when the US is not deep, uh, hiring or appointing appellate body judges? So this is one question that has been looming since I think late Obama uh, administration into the Trump administration and then even under Biden because basically the US is pushing for strategic trade and not fair trade or free trade. This is, a, this is what we're witnessing right now. And that's why at the WTO, the adjudication processes, you could file, but you're not gonna see recourse. And that's why countries are wondering where to go next in terms of uh, these kinds of policies because the US government is driving it rather than at the you know, global or international level, there is some kind of an initiative. Or... So th that, that's like the looming question here and political wins, yes, domestic politics in the US basically, this IRA and Inflation Reduction Act. This is essentially a domestic politics endeavor, and it has aggrieved many Asian and European allies because of the protection, protectionist nature of it. So foreign trade complaints, most likely because the WTO is in stalemate, countries will have to choose uh, arbitration uh, in different places. There, there are commercial courts. Uh, there's one in Singapore. Com companies will have to seek recourse somewhere else, or maybe at the USITC just as LG and SK have done, or I'm not sure whether uh, in Europe you could have the same kind of uh, output in, in terms of uh, satisfying output in terms of lawsuits, but we'll see. And uh, I agree entirely with uh, what Dr. Kim has said regarding um, the allegations on Asian country subsidies. Yeah, just to quickly respond to, to to what Dr. Kim said, and that was not to say that uh, it was not making any allegations or anything. I think, honestly, of chips and science, one of the most important uh, aspects is some of the, the workforce development uh, in R&D funding. I mean, number one, the investments that we can make into the, our strong suits and then trying to build up our workforce as well, because that is a gap that we have. Um, and it is impressive the way in which um, countries like South Korea have been able to build up that robust talent network uh, and somewhere that we can learn. Thank you so much to our three uh, fantastic speakers. It's been a very um, productive and cross-cutting conversation we had this afternoon or this morning in, in Seoul and South Korea and evening as well in the East Coast. Um, any final thoughts or remarks um, before we close uh, the session from our speakers um, very briefly? Um, Dr. Park, um, we can start with you and then followed by Ms. Samer and finally Dr. Kim. Well, I saw another question here regarding subsidies, but I don't know if I should use that time. How much time do I have? One minute? Uh, two minutes, minute, uh, a minute or two, yeah, probably, yeah. Okay. So without what Intel is claiming is that it needs to have the lion's share of the 52 billion in terms of its own production and training and equipment acquirement, et cetera. 
And we've seen this through Intel's efforts uh, over the past few months, uh, it's uh, liaisons with the White House, we've seen that. So we're not gonna lie here. Um, that they can't fabricate in the US without subsidies, I think that's an overstatement. If you intend to invest, then you can invest, but you want the cash from the government, so you're just gonna go, go on with it. I think that's basically it. Um, Samsung and TSMC uh, will continue to rival in this area. It's, it's a given fact that Samsung is going also into designing. And the reason why from the onset of the conversation that we had today, I mentioned that it's a cutthroat industry, it's highly competitive, and we're gonna be seeing more conflict and cooperation is because essentially what you are witnessing is, um, very, very talented workforce in, in Taiwan and South Korea, as well as in the US and China. Uh, I wouldn't say too much on the Japan side. I, I see Japan as more of a chemical producer now in terms of semiconductor um, industry. Um, the competition will continue to grow. And in the case that there is a military conflict uh, on the Taiwan Strait, then this becomes a huge issue because it's inter in, then it becomes intertwined with the national security issues in South Korea and the overall Korean Peninsula issue. And we're talking about this as we speak. Uh, you know, I'm working with the Korean um, government on a project right now and we're discussing this, um, this uh, contingency issue. And what my request to these kinds of conversations which I engage in um, to my US counterparts is the two-way street that we can envision because the two-way street is not really visible in the context that the requirements are coming. And I hope there is a thought that, uh, you know, from the US side that's given in order to facilitate conversation. Uh, Ms. Samir? Yeah, well, I'll just thank you again for, for having us for this conversation. Um, and I guess I'll just end on saying that I think that this really is uh, a key moment for cooperation just with, I think, driven by the uh, the COVID pandemic, as you had mentioned before, there was this heightened urgency worldwide that we needed to shore up semiconductor supply chains. And there's a lot of energy going into bolstering the industry. And I think right now is really key as countries are deciding to invest more in, and to beef up their industries to find the ways in which we can uh, create complementary, a complementary system and to uh, both to create a more robust and diversified supply chain. Um, so I, I think this is a good opportunity to work through uh, a lot of uh, a lot of those areas to make sure we are being complementary and, and not as competitive. Recognizing that competition is innate and it's still going to happen among industries, but I think it's a good opportunity to try to work through some of those issues. Dr. Kim, please. Well, again, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'd like to just emphasize that uh, the cooperate the technology cooperation that happens between U.S. and Korea in the semiconductor space is already pretty high, already very successful. Uh, indeed, we really could not exist as a company um, without uh, being able to use U.S.-based technology in terms of the software and the uh, and and the equipment and other critical inputs to to our production. Um, so we do have, we do see a dependence uh, in a good way to uh, to 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 U.S. Um, it's very possible that the, you know some in the U.S. can see their depend uh, dependence of memory chips on Korean companies, but it, I could easily flip that around and say we have a dependence on our U.S. customers to purchase our products, um, and so I, I don't think it's productive for us to go down into a discussion of dependence as being a bad thing among allies and among friends. Um, you know, this is the economic system that U.S. has championed for, for, for decades and more than a century, um, and we've done a great job of participating in it and competing fairly, and we hope that that will continue. Um, I do see uh, more room for technology cooperation um, throughout the technology stack as it continues to do so. I, I agree with Dr. Park that, you know, I, I'm not sure if we'll see um, close uh, technology cooperation among our competitors. I think that would not feel natural to us, but I do see adjacent companies um, of which we can pair chips with for better functionality. I do see some room for cooperation there in that space. Um, 
And to to get to Richard's question um, on on the Q and A box, um, you know, Samsung, TSMC, and Intel have stated for a variety of reasons, as as Dr. Parker said, not the same reasons, but different reasons why um, why they would uh, uh, would like access to them. I think the primary reason is, of course, because uh, we're all global. We all have to remain globally competitive. Um, uh, there are natural cost differences between the U.S. Um, and other locations. It is higher cost location. Um, yeah. For for a variety of reasons, especially if you get at the the productivity and efficiency of the production that tends to happen in the U.S. Um, and so I could certainly understand from a variety of companies standpoint, they see it and they say, well, we have choices as where well we can produce. Um, the customers are the same, so if we choose to produce in one place over another, um, for more than economic reasons, is there a way to offset that cost? I think those are natural questions to answer. Um, and certainly, um, I've been. Um, I think the the folks at the Commerce Department, at the White House, and others have been incredibly thoughtful uh, and engaged. Um, and I'm and I'm really hopeful that um, that very and those thoughtful uh, leaders on both sides uh, of the countries will will figure out a way forward to continue the good relationship that the two countries have, particularly related related to this um, uh, re- this critical industry. Um, as important as the you know, semiconductor industry is in the United States, and it has received a huge amount of attention. Um, and I also remember a time when I was covering the semiconductors uh, at, the, at the U.S. government when nobody seemed to care. Um, <laughs> I have to I have to remind folks here in the U.S. that yes, it is important here in the U.S., uh, particularly if you see cars not being sold because they can't get two or two or three chips. It is of paramount importance to countries like Taiwan and Korea. It is the lifeblood of the economy. It is the lifeblood um, of uh, the future of those economies as well. Um, and so I think recognizing that and not taking that importance lightly um, would be highly encouraged. Um, just because we have somehow chosen to wake up to the national security importance of this doesn't mean that it trumps um, investments that companies have made, uh, the importance that these things have in an export-driven economy in South Korea, semiconductor exports are a huge part of that. Um, of course, it is of national importance. And I think having a respect for each other in these uh, dialogues, whatever shape it takes, whether it's chip four, chip two, chip, whatever it is, I think it's so important for us to keep in mind. Um, and we as a company will always um, have productive dialogues with, uh, with any government that wants to have conversations with us. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Indeed, recognizing a two-way street, as Dr. Park has mentioned, a two-way conversation uh, between um, all the parties or stakeholders involved will definitely be the key in advancing an equitable sort of type of technological cooperation, be it on investments or an exchange of talent and technology. And again, thank you to all our participants uh, for being with us today. We hope you'll continue to be engaged with Pacific Forum programming, which you can find more on our website at www.pacforum.org. The third session of this series will be in late October. The topic for the final virtual session will be cybersecurity and 5G and 6G. Please stay tuned for more details by subscribing to Pacific Forum or following us on all social media. I'd also like to remind you, uh, our audience, of the post-event survey available on our event page, which we'll share again in the chat box now. We would appreciate if you would take a few minutes to complete the form and share your feedback as we want to make sure that future sessions are engaging and productive as possible. Finally, thank you to the Consulate General of the Republic of Korea in Honolulu, and George Mason Korea Center for Security Policy Studies for making this event possible. We hope that we'll see you at our future events uh, in this series.